Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at two books, The Chaos Gods Come to Meet Landia, 2nd edition, as well as its sequel, Worm Witch, The Life and Death of Belinda Blood. Before we get started though, one thing you may notice is that the video quality on this is much nicer than it has been in the past. Uh, everything should look sharper, crisper, everything should be easier to read while I'm flipping through books. And that's because of my Patreon. Uh, due to support on Patreon, I've been able to really shell out for some really nice equipment to dramatically improve the quality of this channel. Um, I'll be doing shoutouts at the end of this video just because of the huge number of people that have signed up or upgraded their uh, accounts on Patreon recently. Um, and I think that's because I upgraded the $5 and $10 tiers on Patreon with a bunch of new rewards, including stuff like getting to see these videos before YouTube gets to see them, as well as uh, helping to guide the channel by voting on what OSR books I review next. So if you'd like to help and support the channel, you can go right down to the description below and I will have a link there. Thanks to all of my patrons again. Shoutouts at the end of the video. All right, let's start out with our first book, The Chaos Gods Come to Meet Landia. So this is a setting book in a uh, rather gonzo tradition and it's designed to be compatible with old school essentials. This is the second edition. The main changes being that it's been reorganized and reformatted for ease of use. Here's the back of our book here. And I would say that the main selling point of these books is the new classes and spells that they come with. There is a setting, but I think the setting is uh, less fleshed out and useful than I would have liked, but um, there's still a lot of really useful, fun stuff in here. Um, our first page starts out with a poem from Edgar Allan Poe, The Conqueror Worm, which is one of my favorite poems from Edgar Allan Poe. I think I first encountered it in uh, a Hellboy book. One of the trade paperbacks is called The Conqueror Worm. It's a fun poem. So Meatlandia is a land, but it is also a city. Everything is themed around sort of biomancy and chaos magic and just mutation, just like meat and bones and ooze everywhere. It's just how this world is run. We start off right away with some of our new classes. For example, the Chaos DJ Bard, who has a new super ability. Uh, before each adventure, the player gives a list of three songs to the referee, and then over the course of the game, you can turn on one of those songs and play it at the table, and you are, you are able to use as a kind of superpower anything that the song is about. Anything that the song says, you can do. But this can only work one time, and then those songs are gone forever. So at the next session, you have to come up with some new songs. So I think that's kind of fun. It's very fourth wall breaking. It's kind of goofy, but it also brings uh, the power of music directly to the table. Uh, next, we have a Nexus Bard, um, who is very chaos magic themed, and it allows you to summon chaos storms, which have all sorts of uh, crazy effects that can happen. There's a big table at the end of this book that we'll look at showing you some of the effects it can have. We have the Raconteur Bard, uh, the main ability here is that uh, after one night of singing, carousing, etc., you can leave with an NPC posse, and they will accompany the raconteur for 2d6 days unless stated otherwise. There's a big table at the end of the book with lots of interesting NPCs that can just show up and join your party. So in a lot of these old school games, having followers is kind of a big deal, but I've noticed that a lot of parties don't really use that very much. This seems to be a way to really mechanize that and make it a bigger part of the game where you can just be like, nope, I have a bunch of NPCs following me now. We have Death's Hand Assassins, a new assassin type of class, where every time you level up, you roll on this table to see what new powers you get. So every uh, Death's Head Assassin is gonna be different. We have the Caldane, which is a kind of uh, strange human head with like spider legs attached. It can cr crawl around and go up walls and maybe try and take over someone's body. It has some mind control abilities if you're into that sort of thing. We have the Meat Mage, who slowly over time can transform with more and more worm-like abilities until they turn into a giant fleshy worm-like creature. Reminds me a bit of the uh, Dune novels, especially where the Emperor slowly turns into like a sandworm hybrid. There's definitely a lot of Dune influence in this book. We have the Rust Knight, who has the special ability of the Rust Mace, so they have a special mace, and whenever it strikes anything metal, it destroys it instantly. So you can go around smashing people's weapons, armor, and so on. 
some basic rundown on how magic in Meatlandia works. And then we get into our new spell list. We have uh, 12 spells for each level all the way up to level 6. Some of these are spells we've seen before in Old School Essentials, but quite a few of them are brand new spells that fit with this new theme of meat magic. And we're from bony fists to mutating people to a blubber bomb, random transmutations that you might acquire. You can melt people's flesh. You can disarm them. You can get leeches. You can clone things. You can create pandemics, the topical spell, and so on. Uh, next, we have the city of Meatlandia. I assume that this is the main setting that you're supposed to, uh, things are going to take place in. Near the back of the book, there's a map of Meatlandia, the nation, um, but there's really not much information at all on what to do outside of the city. Um, but the city does have a D20 table of rumors that you can use, along with lots of crazy diseases, which seems appropriate. We have a D50 table of random city encounters, which is really the heart and soul of any city campaign. You need to have all sorts of crazy things that you can just throw at your players no matter what they do. And a random refugee table. We have a section on chaos storms back here. It's a D100 table. Uh, anywhere from things like the tallest and shortest people in the area will change heights permanently, or perhaps your clothes are now fireproof, or all magic has the opposite effect for the next D10 rounds. We have meat markets and the cost of buying different um, meat and gross body part type things. Uh, we have some factions here, including the Meat Lord, who's a 14th level lawful meat mage with considerable meat magic upgrades and in a stage two of worm metamorphosis. We have a couple NPCs, some of his lieutenants, some uh, gooey monsters. We have the Rust Lord, who's one of his uh, main enemies. I assume if you're a Rust Knight, you're probably aligned with this guy. The Death's Hand, an Assassin's Guild of some sort, and some Bardic Brotherhoods. What's going on beneath the city, and lots of magic items, which of course are ripe to be stolen for any old school D&D campaign. You get, oh, I like this one. You got a Wizard Head, and the Wizard Head already has some spells memorized, so you can kind of force the spells out of the Wizard's Head. It's like a scroll, but, you know, it's a Wizard Head. That's more fun than a scroll. Some uh, uh, monsters like the Chaos Worms, the Flesh Golems. golems. Uh, th this does have giant sandworm-like creatures that can like burst from the ground and dramatically reorganize the landscape. Again, very Dune-like. Some legendary encounters. And some game seeds to get things going for your game. A Raconteur Posse, if you're the Raconteur Bard, Roll up some NPCs and just grab them and go. And some maps, the Kingdom of Meatlandia and Meatlandia City over here on the side. The pages are quite glossy, so getting a little bit of glare. Hopefully it's not too bad. All right, and then we'll look at the sequel that came along after this. This is The Worm Witch, Life and Death of Belinda Blood. This is actually nominated for an Ennie Award this year, I believe for Best Monster or Adversary. Uh, however, on the Ennie Awards page, it didn't say which monster it was nominated for. So I guess you have to take your own guess. Oh, here is the back of the book. And check it out for yourself. So the main theme here is that this takes us off the coast of Meatlandia to an island uh, where there are these worm witches and there's a whole different civilization there that the meat lord is trying to conquer. So it goes into some of those classes and lots of new spells that go along with them. First off, we have the uh, worm wardens who are a more fighter type character. Their job is to guard the Worm Witches. They're kind of the military class. And despite being a military class, they have some um, magic-like powers. For example, they can shed their skin figuratively and blend into their surroundings. Uh, they can also spit worms. They can sense vibrations caused by their opponent during combat, uh, which allows them to anticipate enemies' moves. And then we have the real main class here, the Worm Witch. 
and worm witches can start getting more and more worm-like over time. At fifth level, they may change form into a, a worm of any kind, as long as the length is between six inches and 10 feet once per day. Lots of different types of worms that you can summon here. There's uh, more information about these in the back of the book. And then we get into the worm witch spells, which only go up to level five. And similar to what we saw in Meatlandia, uh, there is some stuff from Old School Essentials, but plenty of new things as well. Including things like the Mass of Maggots, Worm Writhe, Wave of Worms, Plague of Worms, Creeping Doom, Worm Sense, and so on. We have a map here of the actual land. So unlike our first book, um, the rest of this book is really detailing these locations. So rather than just stay in one city, I think the intent here is to be able to adventure across the land and visit lots of different places. Now, the difficulty that I have with this, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it says that one hex equals 60 miles, uh, which is enormous for a hex. Uh, a hex being 60 miles, means that like the entire island of Ireland, for example, would fit about here on this. So all of this is, I don't know, roughly the size of the entire UK uh, plus Ireland maybe. So this is a huge expanse of land. And the hexes are so large that there's simply no way you could cross one in one day. Uh, crossing one of these hexes would take maybe three days, possibly more if you're dealing with rough terrain, which makes them not very useful as hexes because when it takes three or four days to get across one, how do you know where you are inside of one? They just don't become useful as a kind of measuring tool. Also, it means that these locations, which are fleshed out later in the book, are very far apart from each other. So to just go from like one of these little locations to another, it's gonna take you a week or more. So everything is just really spread out. And what's going on in between those locations? There's just not a lot there. I suppose an easy solution to this would just be to dramatically shrink the island and just make everything one hex equals six miles, perhaps. That might be a place to start to making this a bit more usable. Now, the layout for each of these locations is quite good in the sense that each one is pretty much just a one page spread. So there's not a lot of flipping around. Everything you need is right there. Um, but there's really not a lot given to some of these locations. Um, there's a kind of in-universe flavor text here, maybe like a, a journal entry, so that you can get a sense of what the characters there would think about this location. But then there's not a lot of gameable material uh, for many of these. So there might be, how many Nixies do you find there? And you know th that's about it. When you've traveled for an entire week to get to this location, I suppose that could be a bit disappointing. Um, to run this as a setting, I think the Game Master or the Dungeon Master would have to add a lot more material on their own. We do have another city, Fleshtopia, and this has a good seven or eight other locations, which are uh, laid out here and given a little bit more information on. Um, but again, it's just not that much for a city. What we saw in Meatlandia was much better. Simply more things to work with. Isle of Worms, we have the Lost Coast, Mount Worm. For many of these locations, it's simply you get there and maybe you find one monster or maybe like a couple cougars or possibly like a shepherd. And then maybe there is some treasure there, though oftentimes it's not um, explained how you would find that treasure. And then I guess you would go on to the next place. You would really have to build a campaign yourself rather than relying on material from the book for the setting. At least that's my impression. We do have a couple locations that have more information where they're more like adventure locations, um, but they often just have you know, two or three uh, things there. At the back of the book, we have a section on the worms of An Annalita. I think it's how you say it. That's the name of the uh, island itself. From the brain worm to the broomstick worm, chaos worm, death worm, mealworms, uh, and so on. 
and we have a rundown of the Dreadnought, which is a gigantic biological horror thing created by the Meat Lord in his attempted conquest of this island. We have Belinda Blood herself, who is a bit like the leader of the Resistance. That, at least that's the impression I get here. She's kind of a mythical figure on the island who may or may not still be alive. And she gets a, a page description of her, but really that's about it. There's not a whole lot tying her into the rest of the world. I think the Dungeon Master would have to do that themselves. And that's the end of our book. So as I mentioned before, um, the city in this one is pretty good. You could definitely run that as a sort of a fairly short city campaign. Um, but the setting here, I think, would need a lot more work to work as a full campaign. Uh, however, the spells and the classes are a lot of fun and are very easy to steal for your own old school campaign, especially if you're running old school essentials. All right, that's it for today. Uh, as usual, links are in the description below if you would like to check these out for yourself. And I have to do some shout outs to all of my new patrons, uh, including people like Natalie Dawson, Ronnie Bob, Kazet Khan, Jimmy Gustafson, Alex Zurich, uh, Don, Jennifer Dahl, Kobold, uh, Trevor Bramble, Jay Grooms, Liz the Wiz, Ian Dimitri, Brian, Ricardo Sedan, Alexander Haggerty, uh, Dale Murchie, Angelo Pelegi, Alex Mickley, Abash Islam, Zachary Murray, Evan T. Smith, uh, M. Silver, Arandi Huippi, uh, John Skubaka, and we also have Rolk, Aaron Seymour, Dan Webb, and Roll Stats. Uh, thank you everyone who either became a patron recently or upgraded. Your support is greatly uh, appreciated and it allows me to upgrade the channel as we see today. All right, that's it for today, everyone. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you guys next time.